Well, good morning, Grace Church. Good to see you all this morning. And it's just not great to be in the house of the Lord this morning. And just as I was just in that first, those first lines of that, that first song that we sang, Oh, the love that will not let me go, I rest my weary soul in thee. And I've just been meditating on that truth as I've been preparing this passage, or just that we find our true peace in God, in Jesus Christ. And it is. It's just such a balm for our souls that we can find true rest, true, true peace in Him. And so I'm excited to be able to preach to you this morning and to just bring the Word. And um, I just trust and know that God's Word will not return void. And so it's just my prayer that I can faithfully bring that to you this morning. And uh, I noticed uh, I, I had a typo on the, the outline. It's actually going to be John 16, not 6. But so if you could all turn in your Bibles to John chapter 16. And in this section, as you turn there, this is mere hours before Jesus' arrest and eventual crucifixion. John record, records some of the last words Jesus spoke to his disciples before these heart-wrenching but glorious events. So we're going to pick up in uh, verses 25 of chapter 16. The word of the Lord says, These things I have spoken to you in figurative language. An hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figurative language, but will tell you plainly of the Father. And that day you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I will request of the Father on your behalf. For the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me and have believed that I came forth from the Father. I came forth from the Father and have come into the world. I am leaving the world again and going to the Father. His disciples said, Lo, now you are speaking plainly and are not using a figure of speech. Now we know that you know all things and have no need for anyone to question you. By this we believe that you are, that you came from God. Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? Behold, an hour is coming and has already come for you to be scattered, each to his own home, and to leave me alone. And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken to you, so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. And please pray with me. Dear Father, May you be exalted this morning in the preaching of your word. Through your spirit, please give us eyes to see and ears to hear the glorious truths of your precious and perfect word. Give us faith to believe and grace to understand. Thank you for sending your spirit to help and comfort us. We thank you and praise you for Jesus, our Lord and Savior. And it's through his name we pray this to you. Amen. What is the most important thing about you? Or more generally, if you had to describe one thing, what it is that, that, that is the most important thing in a person's life? Well, think that over. What is the most important thing about you? We think may, of what the world may answer to this question, and they say, kind of tritely, well, it's not how many breaths you take, but it's about how many breaths you take away. Or how about one psychologist said, we need to seek and grow in emitting positive energy to ourselves and those around us. Whatever that may mean. Really? Positive energy? Just give off a, a good vibe? That's, that's it? That's what life is about? That's the most important thing? No, those aren't it. How about this? The most important thing about you is how you relate to and think about God. I'm just saying that glorious hymn, Behold Our God. And that is my goal this morning and next week, is that we behold our God, and namely through the person and work of Jesus Christ. How you relate to God flows from what you know and embrace about God. Your relationship God, to God is directly linked with your knowledge of Him, or more aptly, your belief in Him, or your faith in Him, of who He is and what He has done. Even Psalm 29, as we read this morning, it extolled who God is and then the works that He had done, that He gives peace. And that's over and over what we do as Christians. We look to God, we see who He is and what He has done in our lives. And we give Him our praise and our worship. A.W. Tozer, in The Knowledge of the Holy, says it this way, What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. The history of mankind will probably show that no people has ever risen above its religion, and man's spiritual history will positively, 
demonstrate that no religion has ever been greater than its idea of God. Worship is pure or base as the worshiper entertains high or low thoughts of God. Now listen to this. The gravest question before the church is always God himself. And the most portentous or important fact about any man is not what he at a given time may say or do, but what he in his deep heart conceive God to be like. So the most important thing is not what man says or does, but what he in his heart conceives God to be like. Well, let's take that a little bit further. What do you believe about Jesus Christ? The most important thing about us will always be connected with Jesus Christ. Our union with him or lack thereof, our conformity to his image or lack thereof, or our love for God that we pour out on Jesus, the victorious God-man who has conquered, or our lack thereof. And just as we dive in this morning, is your heart inflamed with the excellencies of God? Do you behold Jesus, the face of God, and just long for him, to know him, to please him? He talks about in this passage, in the, the farewell discourse, that those who love me will keep his commandments. Do you seek to love God and obey him in this way? Does his love enthrall you? Oh, perfect love that will not let me go. I want us to be mentally just knocked off our feet, lying in awe of Jesus, of who he is, what he did and does, and what he gives. And turn a few chapters over to John 20, and we're going to look at verses 30 and 31, which is just a great summary of John's gospel. So John 20, verses 30 through 31. John records, Therefore, many other signs written, also performed in the presence of the disciples, excuse me, therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. John's gospel is all about Christ from the opening verses to the end. The apostle reveals to us the life of Jesus that he has even experienced firsthand. Remember, John is the apostle who he describes himself as the the apostle, the disciple whom Jesus loved. He knew God. He knew about God, but he knew him intimately. He knew Jesus Christ. Well, why did he write this gospel? Again, so that you may believe, that's to us, the readers, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One, the Son of God, and that believing Here's the result. You may have life in his name. That's why we have the Gospel of John. Belief in Jesus as the Christ and the Son of God. It's faith in Jesus. Why? So that we may have life, abundant life, and eternal life, as John, throughout his Gospel, further explores. So as we we begin to study this great passage this morning, I want us to consider the person and work of Jesus Christ. Who he is, what he has done, And let us rejoice and take heart because he is the only source of true peace. Again, as we consider the person and the work of Jesus Christ, who he is and what he has done, let us rejoice and take heart because he is the only source of true peace. There are three truths of this passage that I want us to consider as we work our way through. It's in verse 28 we see our Lord's majestic mission. In uh, the following verses we see the disciples' fledgling faith and the Christian's perpetual peace. Sorry, I, uh, I lost my notes here. Um, <laughs> this morning, uh, we are going to primarily focus on verse 28. Um, it was my original intention to do this whole section, but there's just so much in here. It's just so rich and so vast, and so we're going to really just focus in on, on verse 28. We're going to be covering a lot of different scriptures um, that that to support the four main phrases here. So don't please don't feel that you got to turn to all the different passages. Just sit back, listen, write down the references. Um, and it just, just soak in, really, the majestic mission of our God and Savior. And that as we, as we meditate and learn and just study these truths, it's all going to verse 33, that where Jesus says, take courage, or the King James says, be of good cheer, be bold. Why? Because in the midst of tribulation in me, Jesus has overcome the world. And we can have peace if we abide with Christ. 
And it's only in Christ, his person and his work, which it was awesome to hear this week. That's what the Sola Conference is going to be. The, the person and the work of Jesus Christ. It's just, I mean, God just, just blows me away with just how, just in his sovereignty and his providence, how he just orchestrates these things. Um, but uh, faith always must have an object. And saving faith for a Christian is the object of Jesus Christ, his person and his work. So with that, we're going to look at verse, verse 28. Um, and look at our Lord's majestic mission. In which he says, John records for us, I came forth, Jesus speaking, I came forth from the Father and have come into the world. I am leaving the world again and going to the Father. Jesus is speaking to his disciples before his imminent death on the cross in what's called the upper room or farewell discourse. This section begins back in chapter 13 as the disciples and Jesus go to the upper room preparing for the Passover. And it ends just before John 17 when Jesus offers his great high priestly prayer up to God the Father. But so already at this point in the discourse, Jesus has washed the disciples' feet. They celebrated the Passover. Satan entered Judas and is gone to round up the soldiers that would eventually arrest him and eventually crucify him. And, but throughout this, there have been many hard sayings and realities that the disciples are faced with. Jesus says, I'm leaving. They don't understand that. And they want to go with him. And he says, well, you can't go where I'm going. And over and over, we, we saw that, that he, the disciples are saying, oh, well, you're not speaking in figurative language anymore. You're talking plainly because he says, in this passage, I'm going to the Father. But there are several things, several hard things um, that the disciples are confronted with. And he even tells Peter that he will deny him three times. And Peter says, God, I'm going to follow you. I'm going to go with you. And he says, you're going to deny me three times. The disciples will experience great turmoil and tribulation. They are confused at times, seeking to understand. They are rebuked and even saddened by grief at many of Jesus' words. Here's their Lord. He's, he's going away from them. He's just told them he's going to die. He told them they would be hated and even be put to death on account of Jesus. But I want us to see that the tone of this passage, of, of, and I'm speaking of the overall uh, upper room discourse or farewell discourse, which we're at the end of in our text this morning. But the tone is one of encouragement and comfort. Even after, uh, immediately after Peter's rebuke, Jesus says in the first verse of John 14, Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. The hard things, the promises of difficulty and pain and desertion are blanketed by promises of peace and love and power in God. At first I went back through this discourse and I compiled all the comforting and encouraging sayings of Jesus throughout this because I wanted to convey that tone that yes, we see these hard sayings but over and over we see Jesus presenting peace, saying he loves them, that he's sending the Spirit So I went through and I compiled all those things and I had, I think it was about two and a half, three pages of just the different verses. And so, similarly to how John says in the end of the Gospel, if I was to write all the things about Jesus, there wouldn't be enough room in all the books in the world. Well, I, wouldn't, I don't have the time this morning to go through all those encouraging things that Jesus said, but you can go back through, study the Upper Room Discourse, the Farewell Discourse, and just see God's precious promises to his disciples, to his followers. And it's just a really, it culminates here, and I believe what is a, a summary of this, uh, of the, the discourse, and it ends with Jesus saying, take heart, have courage, be of good cheer. In me you can have peace, even in the midst of the world where you will have tribulation. Why? Because Jesus has overcome the world. So that's where we're going. Just, uh, but here's a few of those verses from, from this discourse, and I'm just going to fly through them. Uh, John 14, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. In John 15, these things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy will be made full. You did not cho choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit. I chose you out of the world. John 16. These things I have spoken to you so that you may be kept from stumbling. 
But I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Therefore, you too have grief now, but I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice. And no one will take your joy away from you. This is when he's just told them, they're gonna, the people are going to kill you and think they're doing something good for God. And he says, you too have grief, but I will see you again. And your heart will rejoice, and no one can take that joy from you. Verse 25 of 16 where we started this morning. These things I have spoken to you in figurative language and hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figurative language but I will tell you plainly of the Father. And that day you will ask in my name and I do not say to you that I will request of the Father on your behalf. We have direct access in prayer to God the Father through Jesus Christ. Through what he's done for us. Then, verse 27. For the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and believe that I came forth from the Father. So just the love of God poured out on his children. Now John, if you're already thinking, well, this is saying um, God loves us because we loved him first. Well, first John, John clearly says that we love because God loves us first. And so it was just what he was, he was emphasizing here, just the immense love of God being poured out on us, being poured out on the disciples. So then we get to this glorious verse in verse uh, 28 of 16. The summary statement of Jesus' mission. I came forth from the Father and have come into the world. I am leaving the world again and going to the Father. And then verse 33, these things I have spoken to you. It's very well, uh, he's talking about all the things that just were spoken in chapters 13 through 16. These things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take courage, I have come, overcome the world. So we can have peace in Jesus because of who he is, what he does, and we see that in his majestic mission. Jesus says, starting out in verse 28, I came forth from the Father. This is a declaration that Jesus is the divine pre-existent son. Oh. Sorry, I keep... Uh Getting lost in my, you know, I think my notes got out of order. Sorry about that. Um, right, let's see. Sorry. Oh, there they are. <laughs> okay. Turn back to John, John chapter 1. Sorry for the, the delay there. So I came forth from the Father. I, just, I love reading the Gospel of John because just over and over we get these, these just great summary statements and um, John tells us exactly what he's doing. He tells us at the end of the book that he wrote all these things down so that we may know that Jesus is a Christ, that by believing in him we may have life. He starts right here in the beginning um, that... Uh, that Jesus was in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word um, was with God. And so we're just going to read verses 1 through 5 here. So John 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being <coughs> excuse me, nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The prologue of John here particularly expresses this idea that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and John later reveals that the Word is Jesus Christ. But what's interesting, it, uh, we see here that in the beginning is, it actually says divine is the Word, or God was the Word. But in, in John, in his, in his Greek here, he says he places God first in contrast to the word order of the preceding clause because the, in the beginning was the Word, but in this he then says that Word, God is the Word. And so we have this emphasis that, that the eternal Word, the pre-existent Son who was with the Father, who in fellowship with the Father, the God, the Godhead was in fellowship and communion with each other in the Trinity, that Christ always existed. He is the pre-existent God man um, and, and he is divine God was the word Jesus is the word and the word was with God before even creation itself Jesus makes explicit claims to his divinity 
here and throughout the book of John. And it just, it's crazy to me sometimes when people say, well, you read the Gospels, and Jesus never made claims to be God. And I just, I, they haven't read it. I mean, <laughs> you can go right, right here, you can go to John 8, over and over. I mean, just the I am statements where Jesus is declaring himself to be one with the Father. I, yeah, just go study John with him. That would be a great, great thing to do. Um, but coming from the Father, as we saw in verse 28, where John starts of, of back in chapter 16, how he says, I came forth from the Father. It was a common way of talking about the Messiah's coming into the world. And we'll, we'll fly through some of these verses, but in chapter 3, um, we see John records us that Nicodemus says, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God. And this is uh, 3, verse 2. Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God was not with him. So he says, we know you have come from God. John six fourteen. The people who witnessed the miracles of the multiplication of the loaves and fish in Galilee exclaimed, Surely this is the prophet who has come, who is to come into the world. That's John 6, 14. So again, we have the prophet, um, which there's greater overtones there of being the eschatological prophet, the Messiah. He has come into the world. He has left the Father, as, as verse 28 and 16 uh, points to. The notion of people that they were speaking of the Messiah in this sentence is proved by the fact that then, in the very next verse, they want to go and make Jesus king. So they know he was making claims to be the Messiah, that he was making divine claims that he is God. Because then they rightly said, well, we need to go make you king as well. In John 11, it, uh, Martha, conf Martha confessed, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God. Is that not Peter's confession in Matthew 16 when he says, Who do you say that I am? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. This is Martha confesses this. Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who was to come into the world. And that's 1127. At the least then, this sentence indicates that Jesus was the one sent into the world by God for the work of redemption. But it also means more than this. As Martha's additional phrase, the Son of God, indicates... For it is not just that Jesus was a special servant of God, that he was like an angel that just Gabriel or Michael that God sent to go do a mission, but he's the very son of God. He shares the very nature of God. He is a divine being. He is a divine word. In addition to this, he was with God from all eternity as one, and was himself God. In reference to his heavenly existence, before the incarnation, Jesus told the Jews <clears throat> in John chapter 8, before Abraham was, I am. The very name that God used to reveal himself in the Old Testament to Moses when he said, well, when I go to their people and they say, well, who sent you? He says, tell them that I am who I am. This wasn't lost on the Jews. They went to pick up stones, to stone him to death, which was the punishment given in the law of Moses for blasphemy of someone claiming to be God. They knew Jesus was claiming to be God. Jesus knew he was claiming to God. He was God. In John 3, uh, verse 13, No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. In John 6, in 38, I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me, the will of God the Father. And then in verse 62 of 6, What if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? So Jesus was already at the side of God the Father. And he came. He came to earth. He left the Father and he came into the world. And just one last one. There's so many. But um, if you want to turn to John chapter 17. And just hear Jesus' great assertion from the 17th chapter. Um, and we're going to look at verses 4 and 5 here. So verse 4, John 17. Um, I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. He's saying, God, give me the glory that I had. And... Isaiah 42, 
the prophet records for us, I am the Lord, I am Yahweh, that is my name. I will not give my glory to another. So you have the prophet saying, God says to his people, I will not give my glory to anyone else, to another. That's what idols are. They steal the glory from God. We worship God. We worship created things and not God. God is jealous. The glory is for him and him alone. Isaiah 48, 11, For my own sake, for my own sake I will act. For how can my name be profaned? And my glory I will not give to another. Yet what does Jesus say in verse 4 and 5? I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. Father, glorify me. God just says, I won't give my glory to anyone else but myself. Then you have Jesus the Son saying, God, give me the glory that I had with you. Again, I don't know how you can read these verses and not see Jesus' clear claims to being God. I mean, that, and John tells us that's why he's doing this, so that you may believe that he is the Christ and that you may have life in his name. He is God. And so we, we get that from that phrase that, that Jesus came forth, he left, uh, came forth from the Father, he left the forth, left the Father, excuse me. John Boyce on verse 28 comments, and so here again are claims to both pre-existence, that he was that eternal word, the pre-existent word, and deity, and they are so frequent throughout the public and private teaching of Christ that we can truthfully say that if we do not know this about him, we can in truth know nothing. Jesus claimed to be God and to have come forth from God. And yet, we go back to verse 28 and 16. That's just the beginning. What's more, look at another aspect of Jesus' identity, of who he is, of his person. And it is that Jesus came. He came forth from, uh, into the world. And we see that Jesus is human. And this focuses on, on Jesus' incarnation and humiliation. So that phrase there in 28, the next one, I have come into the world. And as a, why don't you turn back to John chapter 1. Jesus took on flesh and dwelled among us. Merry Christmas. <laughs> that's cool. Everyone popped their heads up. Um, that's what Christmas is about, right? Jesus came into the world. Merry Christmas. This is what we celebrate. That God took on flesh. He dwelled among us. He tabernacled among us. Jesus came into the world, dwelled among us, died for us, was resurrected and ascended on high, and through faith in him, we can be reconciled to God and be co-heirs with Jesus. And we're getting that. That's, that's what Jesus' work he did on our behalf. But John 1, um, and look to, starting in verses 14, and we're going to read through, through 18 there. So speaking again of, of the incarnation, that Jesus became human. 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified him, this is John the Baptist, John testified about him and cried out saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. For of his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God, who is in the bosom of the Father, bosom of the Father, Jesus Christ. He has explained him. So the Word became flesh. Jesus, the pre-existent Word, the Word that was with God in the beginning. He became flesh and dwelt among humanity. That Word there is tabernacled. That's when in the Old Testament, God, Yahweh the Father, came and it would be in a, in a cloud um, of either of smoke or, or I think actually it was just a cloud and then it was a pillar of fire and his presence would come and abide in the tabernacle in the very presence of God and over and over throughout the Old Testament we see God giving this promise that you will be my people and I will be their God be your God Jesus came and dwelled among us this is what the whole part of the whole Old Testament uh, saints were longing for to God to be in their midst that's why when they get taken from Jerusalem, it is such a travesty because God literally dwelled in the temple. They were ripped away from God's presence. And yet now we have Jesus Christ come in the flesh 
and he is forever abiding with us for those who have our faith in him. He abides. The word became flesh. This is where the word incarnation comes from. John says, and I entered the world, that second phrase in verse 28. It is interesting that Jesus speaks of having come and entered rather than have been sent. Because there's elsewhere in John where it talks about how the Father sent Jesus into the world. It is true that Christ was sent by the Father. John 12, 49 says this. But this is not the point Jesus is emphasizing here. The point is the voluntary nature of his incarnation. Jesus was born because he wanted to be. I was just thinking about Jesus is the only one who has ever chose to be born. None of us had that option. Jesus voluntarily came to earth, took on flesh so that he could redeem us. Speaking of the incarnation, Wayne Grudem comments, It is by far the most amazing miracle of the entire Bible. It is by far the most amazing miracle of the entire Bible. God taking on flesh. Far more amazing than the resurrection and more amazing even than the creation of the universe. The fact that the infinite, omnipotent, eternal Son of God could become man and join himself to a human nature forever. So that infinite God became one person with finite man. Will remain for eternity the most profound miracle and the most profound mystery in all the universe. So that leads to the question, why did the eternal Son of God become man? And this is when we start to transition into the work of Christ that flows out from the person of Christ, who he is. But really when we ask, well, why did Jesus come into the world? I like to think of it as if you ask someone, well, why don't you go cr- count the, all the brilliance and facets of a gleaming diamond in, in the sun? And it just... <laughs> You could go all over the place. There's so many things the scripture tells. And so we're going to narrow that focus and, and I believe what John, the, in the book of John, primarily teaches. But yeah, again, it's just like trying to examine a diamond and count the facets and the brilliance of that diamond and say, well, these are all, all the reasons. And I think that's part of an eternity in God. We're going to be just plumbing those depths. But the first... Uh, answer we're going to say is is Jesus became man in order to be our savior. Save us from our sins. In order to die in our place and therefore pay the penalty of our sins so that we might be saved from the penalty and power of sin. Back in chapter 1, you don't have to go back there, but John the Baptist, when he saw Jesus coming, he says, uh, verse 29, the next day he saw Jesus coming to him and said, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus came to be the sacrifice that takes away the sin of the world. John 3, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe in him will not perish, but have eternal life. But also, verse 17, God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world. So there we see that sending language of of Jesus being sent by the Father out of the Father's great love but that the world might be saved through him, through Jesus Christ. Jesus was sent to save sinners. And we see this clearly witnessed throughout the rest of the Bible. In Luke 19.10, Jesus came to seek and save the lost. First Timothy 1.15, Christ came in the world to save sinners. Um, The second reason that Jesus came into the world, that he took on human flesh, he was humiliated, as Philippians 2 talks about, that he put aside his glory that he had as God. The second reason is that he wanted to reveal God the Father to the world. And again, we're going we're to fly through some verses here. But we, we see this by simply examining the occasions on which Jesus speaks of having come into the world or having by sent into the world by God. So here's a scattering of such sentences and just as one is likely to find them by just reading quickly through the Gospel of John. So picking up here, um, I tell you the truth. We speak of of what we know and we testify what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. And that's 3.11. The one who comes from above is above all. He testifies to what he has seen and heard. The man who has accepted it has certified that God is truthful. So there Jesus, he's saying, I've come to you to reveal things about the Father. In that passage, it was God is truthful. 
For one whom God has sent speaks the words of God. For God gives the Spirit without limit. So God the Father gives the Spirit. My teaching is not my own, Jesus speaking here. It comes from him who sent me. Again, revealing the will of the Father. Revealing God the Father. So Jesus came to die to save us from our sins, but also to reveal the God of the universe to us. Um, I am telling you what I have seen in the Father's presence. Again, that I am. That was from John 8. That I am language. As it is, um, further on in John 8, you are determined to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Witness to God. Again, I did not speak of my own accord, but the Father who sent me commanded me what to say and how to say it. Whatever I say is just what the Father has told me to say. What the Father has told me to say. Jesus came to do the will of the Father and to reveal the Father. In the great prayer of John 17, Jesus addresses the Father directly. And he says later in verse 8 and 14, I gave them the words you gave me, and I've given them your word. The humanity of Jesus is so important. Why he took on flesh. The incarnate God. Jesus is God. He reveals God to the Father to us and he accomplished everything that in our sin we could not do. God gave the law in the Old Testament so that people could have that relationship with him. The whole point was to reveal that we can't, we don't have that righteousness. We can't measure up to God's standards. But the perfect God-man Jesus taking on flesh could. He fulfilled all the righteousness of God's law. And that's what, at salvation, not only is our guilt, our sin removed, but we inherit and receive the righteousness of Jesus Christ. His perfect life credited on our behalf. God doesn't see our sin. He sees the perfection of Jesus Christ. And that's accomplished through the person and the work of Jesus Christ. David Platt puts it this way, Jesus Christ came to live the life we could not live, to die the death we deserve to die, and to rise in victory over the enemies we could not conquer, sin and death. And we'll get there more next week. But Jesus Christ came to live the life we could not live, to die the death we deserve to die, and to rise in victory over the enemies we could not conquer. Just as I was studying a Christmas carol just kept popping in my head and just hark the herald angels sing glory to the newborn king peace on earth and mercy mild God and sinners reconciled Is that's the mission of Christ mild he lays his glory by in the incarnation born that man no more may die born to raise the sons of earth born to give them second birth veiled in flesh the Godhead see Hail the incarnate deity. Pleased as man with men to dwell, Jesus our Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Hail the heaven-born Prince of Peace. Hail the Son of Righteousness that we get. And light and life to all he brings. It's like the jo Gospel of John is just summarized in a Christmas carol. I love it. And the first two phrases in John 16, 28 tell us about the identity of Christ that he departed from the Father, he left the Father, and came into the world. It tells us who he is. He's God and man. He left the Father and came forth into the world. He dwelled, he taber tabernacled among us. But what's more, let's look at the next two phrases in verse 28. I am leaving the world and going to the Father. So there's even more. This half of the verse focuses on Jesus' work, or in another sense, what his life has accomplished. After the work of redemption was completed in Jesus, culminating in his death and resurrection, which like his incarnation, Jesus went to willingly. Jesus, I think it's in Luke, he talks about how he set his eyes like flint on the city of Jerusalem. And he laments over them, and he wishes to gather them in out of his love. He went. He could have called down angels. He, could, he didn't have to go to the cross. Christ in his love voluntarily went to it to, to do the will of the Father. So after the work of redemption was completed, Christ now returns to the Father as the victorious Savior King. And he is ascended and glorified. That's why in 17 he prays to God, Give me the glory back that I had with you before the world existed. And it's not blasphemy. 
these aspects of the work of Christ correspond with how I have there the outline that Jesus overcame and the word is to conquer or to have victory. And that aspect of victory uses the language of verse 33 where all of this is building towards. So we see not only just to know these things about Christ, it's really meaningless. But it's what, how is that going to impact you? Jesus says, take these great truths, these things that I've, I've spoken to you so that you may have peace. Don't just hear these things and let it fly right over you or say, oh, that was good. And we'll get here more next week, but it's so that we can, we can have peace. That our weary souls can find rest in the love in Jesus Christ. I do want to point out, um, for those of you with the NASB translation, it says, I am leaving the world again. And what's, he's not saying, okay, well, I, I came, I left, I came, and now I'm leaving the world again. It's just, uh, um, it's an adverb that can re- means to return to a position or state or accomplishing something in a like manner. Um, and this is why it's chosen. He's saying, you know, I, I left the Father, I came in the world, and likewise, I'm leaving the world and going back to the Father. And so, if you see that again and think, oh wait, was there another time that he came and we didn't know? Um, that's not what John's getting at here. Uh, so just wanted to, uh, for, for those who may have saw, seen that, point that out. Um, but yeah, back to the main phrase here. I'm leaving the world and going to the Father. Jesus overcame. The atonement accomplished um, and Jesus' glorious return to the Father. That's what it's getting at there. Later, even Christ is shown to be victorious over the whole world, as he declares in 33. Um, and we'll hit this more next week, Lord willing. Um, but just a couple of verses on, on the atonement, on, on Christ's work on our, our behalf, that he has redeemed us. Second Peter 2. So Peter, who is here present with the Lord in this discourse, who very well knew the grief and the sorrow when he said, you're going to deny me. And Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. uh, Peter was there, and then he later says in his epistle, Jesus Christ, he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you were healed. So that's the work of redemption accomplished, the atonement on our behalf, that work of Christ that that he came came into the world to save sinners. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, He made him to be sin who knew no sin. Or I'm sorry. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. After accomplishing the mission of redemption, Jesus returned to heaven to be with the Father. Mission accomplished. Job well done. But actually, it still doesn't end there. Jesus is still ministering. It's now at the Father's right hand that he ministers as our high priest, making intercession for us. Romans 8, 33, 35. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, the Messiah. Yes, rather, who was raised, who was at the right hand of God, and also intercedes for us. In the verses leading up to... 28 and John 16 Jesus just promised them you can go anything to the father or you can go to the father and ask for anything in the name of the son you have direct access to the father and it's because Jesus is interceding for us he's made that uh, um, he has interceded us for, as the high priest and we can have that access to God and then I just love this verse 35 of Romans 8 who will separate us from the love of Christ will tribulation Isn't that what he says here in verse 33? You can have peace even amidst tribulation. You can't be separated from the love of Christ. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Basically, nothing can. In 33, in me you have peace. In the world you have tribulation. Jesus did all of this. Voluntary, out of his great love for us. He's also our advocate. First John 2, 1, if you want to write that down. Um, as our high priest, Jesus gives us grace to keep from sinning and, and works in conjunction with the Holy Spirit to empower us in that way. He restores us when we confess our sins. 
And Jesus' ministry in heaven makes possible our ministry of witness on earth through the power of the Spirit that he sends after Christ returns to the Father. He even tells the disciple in this course, this discourse, I need to go from you. If I don't leave you, I'm not, I can't send the helper, the comforter, the Holy Spirit. And um, if you want more of that, just go listen to uh, Bruce Ware's uh, lectures from, from, from a few weeks ago and just, just get, again, get a glimpse of just the majesty of God and the Holy Spirit. Um, First John, or I mean, sorry, John 10, 17, 18, I lay down my life only to take it up again. Speaking again of that voluntary nature of Christ's love for us and what he did. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and to take it up again. The crucifixion was not something that was put upon Jesus against his will. Over and over he says, God, I want to do your will. My food is to do the will of you, of the Father. His entire ministry was directed towards the cross in which he joyfully embraced. It is only at the cross of Christ and his voluntary death for us that we learn that God truly is love. Love is seen at the cross. Oh, love that will not let me go. For this reason, there is hardly a verse in the Bible which speaks of God's love that does not in the same context, often within the same verse, speak of Christ's voluntary sacrifice. John 3.16, perfect example of this. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son. He loved and he gave. Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. 1 John 4.10 declares, This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. That's the work of Christ on our behalf. Jesus has overcome. He has a victory over the world. As God promised in Genesis 3, Jesus has now dealt that fatal blow to the serpent. He has crushed or he has bruised the head of the serpent. He's done it by accomplishing redemption as a conquering, atoning Savior. The Lamb slain before the foundation of the world. That's what John writes in Revelation. As John describes him. Um, and then we see in the last phrase of verse 28 and 16 that Jesus will return. He is the ascended glorified King. And Jesus says here, I am going to the Father. His work is done He's, uh, on earth. The significance for us that Jesus has returned to the Father, having come to this earth and died for our... What is the significance? That Jesus has returned to the Father, having come to this earth and having died for our salvation. There are several, several reasons here, and I'll go the, through these pretty quick. Um, but first, so the significance, significance that Jesus has returned to the Father. It shows that the work of redemption is completed, and we can be confident as we come to God on the basis of, of Christ's finished work. If the work was not done, Christ would still be here completing it. But it is done. Hence, he has returned to heaven, where he sat down at the Father's right hand. Hebrews 10 uh, speaks of it this way in verses 11 through 14. Every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. They do it over and over and over and over and over and over. They're covered in blood. They die. The next generation of priests come along. They do it over and over and over and over and over. Jesus comes once. He dies once. He's the perfect sacrifice. He, verse 12, Hebrews 10, speaking of Jesus, the perfect high priest, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God. It's done. He's seated. Waiting from that time onward until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet. For by one offering, his life that he gave, one offering, he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified, who are called out, who are to be separate from the world, to be holy so they can point back to Christ and the Father. Secondly, Christ's return to be at the right hand of the Father is one from which he intercedes for his own. We mentioned that a little bit already. Thirdly, regarding the significance of Christ returning to the Father, it is a fact that demonstrates to us that he is now in a place where he can impart spiritual gifts through us, through the sending of the Holy Spirit. That was the first spiritual gift. It is for 
uh, John 16, 7, It is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And finally, Christ's return to God, to the Father in heaven, is a token that he is coming to earth again. This time in great power and glory and with his holy angels. Jesus is coming. This is as sure as the fact that he has come once to die for our salvation and he is going to return for his church, for his bride, to take them back to glory. He's going to return to the world in glory and reign as the eternal king. John wrote an entire book about this, the book of Revelation. The king is coming back for his church, for his bride, for his glory. And this is what the Bible ends with. The coming eternal reign of the glorious Messiah. God in flesh. Emmanuel. And the saints commune and joy in him forevermore. Christ is coming back in glory. The conquering king is going to return. And one last passage. Acts chapter 1. I'll just read through it. Uh, sorry, in verse 1. The first account, Luke writing here, I composed Theophilus about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day that he was taken up to heaven. Jesus returned to heaven to the Father. After he had by, uh, by the Holy Spirit given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen, to these he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. Again, teaching about God the Father. Gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which he said, you heard of from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. You will be immersed with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Jesus left so the Spirit could come. So when they had come together, they were asking the disciples, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time that you're restoring the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. After he had said these things, he was lifted up. He's returning to the Father. While they were looking on, and a cloud received him out of their sight. As they were gazing intently into the sky while he was going, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them. They also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. Jesus Christ is going to return. He's going to come in glory in the sky. The most important thing about you is not merely knowledge of God, but if you know him. When he returns, are you ready to meet him? Will you greet him as your savior? Or you'll greet him as one you have, whose love you have spurned, whose sacrifice you have rejected. For those of you to whom Christ is precious, does your life reflect the glorious Savior? Turn to Christ. Look to his example. Look to his example. Follow your Lord and Savior. And for, for those of you who do not know Christ, behold your God. Behold the God of the universe. Turn to him in faith in who he is and what he has done. And your sins are wiped away and you get the righteousness of Christ. Verse 28 of John 16 gives us that glorious picture, that majestic mission of Jesus Christ, who he is and what he's done. And I want to close with this quote. Alexander McLaren comments on these four phrases that we've worked through this morning. These four facts, the dwelling in the Father, the voluntary coming to earth, the voluntary leaving earth, and again, the dwelling with the Father, are the walls of the strong fortress into which we may flee and be safe. With them, it, it's, with them the walls, stands four square to every wind that blows. Strike any one of them and it totters into ruin. Make the whole Christ your Christ, for nothing less than the whole Christ and this is from, from one of the creeds, conceived of the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, crucified, dead, buried, ascended into heaven, and sitting at the right hand of God is strong enough to help your infirmities, vast enough to satisfy your desires, loving enough to love you as you need, or able to deliver you from your sins, and to lift you to the glories of his own throne. This is precisely the case. This is Jesus. This person is worth May you find that one and come fully to trust him 
for your soul's good and praise the glory of his grace. Praise God for his glorious grace. Let's pray. Dear Father, thank you so much for sending Jesus to come into the world out of your great love for us and to reconcile us with you. Thank you that we have the privilege and the joy of knowing you and that in the midst of everything the world can throw at us, we can have peace, that we can know your peace through Jesus Christ. I pray that we go forth this week and seek to know Christ more, to love him more, and that our lives just be a, a shining example of him. We pray this all in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you. You are dismissed.